Welcome back to the third day of the school. So as the title of my uh, sort of set of talks say, so I'm going to cover uh, spatial systems, tipping points in spatial systems. So uh, just so that we are all on same page, I will do a brief, brief recap of what we have learned so far, okay? And then we will move forward. So we started off with uh, writing No, basic ideas of dynamical systems uh, to understand uh, the idea of tipping points, right? So we would like to explain if S is some state variable that we're interested in. So this could be, um, you know, um, for example, quality of lake, you know, or the quality of water in lake. This could be uh, vegetation cover of a uh, you know, uh, forest ecosystem. Uh, and any other reasonable quantity you can think of. This could be population size of some species you're interested in. And uh, what we see is that sometimes this can exhibit abrupt uh, changes. Uh, so broadly, uh, the goal of this theme of research is you know, how do we mathematically describe this? Mathematically explain, uh, describe, and so on. So that is one goal. And in fact, some of the very early work on this uh, was actually done in um, uh, late 60s and 70s in the in, uh, in the name popularly known as catastrophe theory. Uh, it was uh, in the literature of mathematics uh, and uh, for, you know, the idea that, you know, very small changes can cause dramatic uh, responses in systems uh, was proposed by a scientist named Tom, if I'm right, right? And Tom, right, okay. And, um, but for some reasons, you know, it was very heavily criticized. It was, it didn't become mainstream. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it was actually very quickly adopted uh, in ecology. There was, there's a paper by Robert May. You know, Tom, as I said, is the sort of, you know, founder of this sort of, you know, field of uh, catastrophe theory. And then uh, a paper by Robert May, I mean, as you can imagine, anything in theoretical ecology sort of, you know, traces back to Robert May in some way or the other. He wrote a paper in 1977, a review article sort of, uh, which uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of popularized this idea that, you know, there are thresholds uh, in ecosystems. Uh, and these thresholds happen because of multiple stable states. And when uh, ecosystems switch from or populations switch from one stable state to another stable state, you can experience you know, dramatic changes in ecosystems. Also, the environment hasn't really changed a whole lot. And in fact, he himself was not the one who wrote the first model. Uh, there were a bunch of people, I think the most famous, uh, the, the most popular model, the model that uh, Porto introduced uh, with that functional response term was actually uh, developed by a name, person named Lud Ludwig, is that right? So that's the you know spruce budworm model that was developed by a scientist named ecologist named uh, Ludwig. So uh, so that's a sort of you know uh, brief history in 1970s. Uh, that sort of you know one of the some of the very early mathematical models were developed, and uh, and sort of this became a uh, very popular with an article by Martin Schaeffer and co-authors. in 2001 and uh, where what what really made uh, people take this lot more now lot more seriously was the fact that uh, uh, he actually this group of authors actually showed uh, not just theoretical possibility but some reasonable data sets that look like this some real ecosystem data sets that actually look like this. And that sort of, you know, uh, uh, took off uh, uh, and inspired uh, the whole sort of, you know, uh, 
research both on the empirical as well as theoretical side over the last two decades. Okay, so now this entire uh, theme as uh, Partho and uh, Sudipta have already very nicely explained so far, uh, uses the ideas of dynamical systems. Uh, uh, and you know, and it has gone far beyond being able to mathematically ex explain and describe this phenomena. So the ultimate goal is, you know, can we make predictions? Uh, can we make predictions about such tipping events? That's sort of, you know, uh, the ultimate goal. And uh, as Parth has already explained, and there was a very good discussion on Monday, and there are some fundamental limitations to be able to explain these. So to be able to predict these uh, transitions or tipping points, but what we can do a reasonably good job of is to sort of come up with some early warning signals. Okay. That's a sort of summary of what we have done so far. I will just do the underlying math associated with that, uh, sort of more mostly covering what uh, Partha covered uh, on Monday, because we need to use that for today's today's class. Okay. So the basic idea is that if there is some state variable x, we can write its dynamics in the form of uh, a very simple dynamical system of this type. Of course, there are also potentially many parameters here. And then uh, we, we then use the not notion of fixed points and uh, stability. So fixed points are those when the system does not change anymore. And you find them by solving, you know, f of x star is equal to zero. And then you look for the stability of these fixed points by computing the slope of the rate function. So f of x is basically the growth rate function of the state variable. You look at the slope of this at the equilibrium point. So let us take an example. If the growth rate function looks like this, Okay, so which are the fixed points in the system? The one will be zero because that intersects the x axis. Other would be this value, it's called this k. Uh, and in fact, what I have uh, written here is the growth rate function that corresponds to the classic load, you know, logistic model. Okay, and uh, now there are two fixed points. How do we find the stability? Uh, we, we look at the slope of the growth function at the at the fixed point. Here is, you see that the slope is positive. That means any perturbation will begin to grow. Uh, and we also see that directly visually here, you know, any perturbation I make uh, from zero has a positive growth rate. Therefore, the system will keep growing. And there's an unstable equilibrium, unstable fixed point. On the other hand, uh, at this fixed point, any perturbation I make either, either to the left it actually comes back because there is a positive growth rate on this side, whereas here there is a negative growth rate. So the perturbations from this come back, okay? And, uh, and again, you can see that from the slope here, the slope here at this fixed point is negative, okay? So, and, uh, and of course, in this very simple model, there are only two, uh, two fixed points, and uh, one of them is stable, and the one that corresponds to carry capacity, and the zero here is unstable, assuming that the growth rate R is positive. So this does not have multiple stable states. This has only one stable state, which is K. And one of the very early models that actually introduced the idea of having multiple stable states actually came uh, in the name of what's called Ali effect. Some of you are probably familiar with this. The idea is very simple. Look at this uh, graph here. It says that the growth rate of a population is zero when you are at zero population, right? That makes sense. There's nothing to grow, right? But the moment there is some positive population size, there is a positive growth rate. And in fact, that keeps growing as the population size increases, which is a maximum and then it decays and it hits zero again at carrying capacity. Now, this seems quite reasonable because I incre increase the population size, therefore the growth rate also increased. This looks pretty good. But let us plot something else. 
uh, which is called the per capita growth rate. So this is the entire population growth rate because f is equal to dx by dt. Let us plot per capita growth rate. Per capita growth rate tells us something about what's the, you know, at, at the individual level. What we do is basically take f and divide that by the total the current population density. If you plot the same for this graph, how will that look like? Now let me now plot on this right here, f by x, which is the per capita growth rate. How would that look like? Oh, sorry, I think this is a bad place to plot. I will plot here. So per capita growth, growth rate is basically x dot by x. And if we plot this for the logistic model, uh, which basically means on the right hand side, you divide by x, what you have is r times one minus x by k. And this per capita growth rate is actually maximum at x equal to zero and it decays linearly. Okay. So in this equation, just remove x and you see the per capita growth. Okay, so now again, if you think about this biologically, when the population size is zero, you have a maximum per capita growth rate. The idea being that the resources are really maximum for everyone. And as the population size increases, resources for everyone is reducing and therefore the per capita growth rate is reducing. Again, it makes perfect sense. But people argued that when the population size is really small, there are other ecological effects that play a role. Maybe when the population size is very small, individuals have a hard time finding mates. And when the population size is very small, there is a lot of stochasticity that can kill population. So they argued that you know, this is just overly simplistic. And what happens is not this, but a slight, you know, when you have a really small population size, you ought to have a negative per capita growth rate. You are more likely to die even when there are lots of resources, okay? So they argue that this is just too simplistic. What really happens is something like this. So unless you reach certain minimum population size, the per capita growth rate will be negative. And then again, the same effect of competition sets in and therefore eventually sort of meet this curve. But, except the, but the main point is that it actually is negative for very low population size until you hit some critical population size of XC. Okay, if you now write down some simple mathematical form that captures this. We have a new equation instead of this. Uh, I will leave it as an exercise for you to, you know, this term doesn't really change. The, for the large x, this will continue to hold true. But the, but the change that happens is for this part and one easy way to incorporate that is this. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's actually x minus x. What this does is that you know when x is less than xc, this at the term will be negative. Therefore, the overall growth rate is negative when the population size is less than zero. Okay. Now let us plot the you know the same growth rate function for this new model. And this this uh, this phenomena is called the Ali effect. The fact that when the population size are really small, the growth rate will be really small is called the Ali effect. And, uh, and uh, if you now plot the entire growth function, it will now look like this. So for large population size, the behavior is same as the logistic model, but for small population size, it has a different behavior. We have a negative growth rate for population size between zero and XC has a positive growth rate only above XC, okay? So now, uh, does it make sense? Any questions on this so far? Okay, now if we have this model, uh, how many fixed points are there? How many equilibrium are there? Uh, it's as many as the number of times this function crosses X axis. So we have one here, we have one here, we have one here, okay? So now, which of them are stable? All that you need to do is look at the growth rate near each of those fixed points. The growth rate here is negative. Therefore, the flow will be towards zero. So zero, which was unstable, now has become stable. So usually the stable fixed points we denote by the solid circle. Let's look at this XC. If I make perturbation to the left, it's a negative growth rate. So XC is unstable. 
on this side, they make a positive perturbation to XC, you know, it has a positive growth rate, and therefore it flows to higher population sizes. So this is an unstable equilibrium. And let's look at K. K has the same feature as before. So this will be stable. Okay. Now, this is a model with three fixed points of which two of them are stable. Okay. This is the simplest ecological model that actually has multiple stable states. In this case, you know, basically by stability. Where one equilibrium is zero, so x star is to denote the stable one. So there are two stable equilibria. Okay, so this is one of the simplest model, and then uh, one can ask the same question. You know, uh, you know, as the environmental conditions change, maybe this x is changing, and uh, you know there will be some conditions when you know this the system can directly jump from a population at k. To an extinction. So one can ask the same question, you know, how do we now make predictions about, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of such transitions. Okay. Okay. So this is the sort of, you know, brief ecological introduction, uh, you know, biological introduction. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, Ali effect is sort of, you know, widely expected in many species, uh, of course, not in all. And often, uh, Although we are writing this in a deterministic form, the underlying reasons why we may expect this could even be entirely demographic. For example, demographic noise can also drive this. Social behavior among organisms can also drive this kind of a behavior by stable dynamics. Okay, so now going back to the mathematics part of it now. Uh, now, uh, one of the questions we were interested in was, uh, how do we think of, um, uh, how do we think of uh, being able to anticipate these transitions, right? And uh, so let us quickly recap that part and uh, try to see how uh, we address and how Partha addressed this question. So let us think of slightly more complex model that Partha wrote, which is this harvesting model. So which had this, this feature. Here we continue to assume that the, the sort of you know, baseline uh, reproduction and population dynamics is governed by logistic model. But on the other hand, you know, it had this term. Okay. Uh, it had this term, an additional death term, a nonlinear death term. And uh, the idea was that this could, this captures, uh, you know, uh, how this population is being harvested by an external agent. This could be predation in some loose sense where we don't worry about who the predator are. Or this could even be, for example, uh, you know, an, for example, an effect of, uh, you know, harvesting by human populations of a uh, certain species. For example, it could be a uh, fishery, a model of fisheries where this term captures uh, how uh, the fisheries affect the population growth rate. Now, why do we think of this nonlinear term? Would be an obvious question. Let us just plot this. You know, let's call this entire term as H of X and X. The basic idea is that if you don't plot this function, it looks like this it's highly nonlinear function, sigmoidal curve. What this tells is that, uh, you know, you know, for initial changes in X, you don't really observe much changes in the in the in the capture rate or the harvesting rate. But the moment you know it, you know, and then it has a some sort of a threshold behavior uh, when uh, when the density of the fishes or the organisms you are capturing increases above some value, uh, we tend to harvest that a lot more. That's the basic idea behind it. And uh, as an exercise, I will leave it to you as an exercise. You could ask why this complex model, why can't I have a much simpler harvesting function? For example, what if H of X was a linear function? 
So I believe it as an exercise to you, you know, to sort of derive a bifurcation diagram what for this model. In fact, uh, this model will actually also show a bifurcation, uh, but of a much simpler nature. I will just give you a hint, you know, it actually shows uh, a transcritical bifurcation. But as Partha showed on last Monday, uh, the, uh, this model actually shows reducing R the way I'll, I'll just keep it the way uh, Partha showed. In this model, if you reduce the growth rate, it shows this behavior. Okay, so the, you could think of it as reducing R but also think of it as increasing H. So there, you know, as you can see the sort of, you know, you can scale one of them. I can divide the entire equation by R, or I could also divide the entire equation by H. So it could be thought of as reducing R or increasing H. Both of them will show mathematically identical results. So it's totally fine. What it means is that if you increase the harvesting for initial range of values, there is a gradual response of the populations to the harvesting. But once the harvesting exceeds, once the harvesting rate exceeds some threshold, there is a you know, abrupt switch to a low population density. And then uh, at that stage, let us say you, you discover that, oh gosh, I'm over harvesting now. I need to stop the system. Uh, but you are stuck in this branch, you know, you're reducing H or uh, at this stage, Will not automatically get there. You have to follow this trajectory to observe another transition that can get back to the original large population size state. Okay. Now, uh, this phenomenon is also called hysteresis. So, why do we call that hysteresis? The name comes from uh, probably from physics, if I am right, uh, from the literature on magnetism. The idea is that the current state of the system cannot be uniquely determined by the underlying dynamics. You also need to know the history behind it. Okay. In, so in the simplest sense, it means that there's an initial condition dependence. So for example, uh, if the harvesting rate is, let us say at this point, some H1, I can't tell whether the observed population will have this population size or this population size. It depends on what was the previous state. You know, uh, basically, if I'm following from a very high harvesting rate and slowly reducing, you know, that history is, uh, uh, the effect of history is present, the effect of memory is present. So I will be in the lower population state. Whereas if the initial conditions were favorable, I could also have it in a higher population. Okay. So the history or the memory of system has a memory of what happened in the past. And you know, you, you know, if you are from a physics background, you would have seen this graph uh, in uh, in in the context of magnetic hysteresis. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the idea behind uh, transitions and hysteresis. Okay. And uh, so now I have had some discussion with some of you uh, on using the term tipping points and uh, critical transitions. So now there is no universally accepted sort of, you know, uh, uh, terms for these, but broadly people, you know, one possible definitions one can go ahead with this, you know, transition that happens at this saddle node bifurcation, okay? It has two features, right? It has the feature of abrupt transition for a very small change in the driver value, okay? And, um, and it is happening at the bifurcation point, okay? And therefore it will show features of critical slowing down that uh, mentioned. So because of that reason, uh, one can call them as critical transition, okay? Now, uh, on the other hand, if you look at transcritical bifurcation, there also you pass through a critical point, but there is no abrupt transition. So maybe one shouldn't call them critical transition, okay? At least in this context of complex systems. Now, what is tipping point or tipping point different from, uh, uh, critical transitions or abrupt transitions, hard to say, you know, uh, it's, I would think that tipping point must be defined as identical to 
a transition that happens at, uh, you know, uh, uh, these bifurcation points. So it's because the word tipping indicates that there's a large response and it has tipped over something, right? So I would think that it would be a transition that happens at this. But is that the only way transitions can happen? Not necessarily. Imagine uh, there is a system that is happily sitting here. Uh, is there a way it can go a transition? Yeah, absolutely. You know, no complex system is deterministic. There is a lot of stochasticity. So it's entirely possible that this driver, uh, the system experiences a lot of external as well as internal stochasticity because of which it can, uh, you know, it's fluctuating around this, but occasionally it can also come so far, it has actually crossed this, uh, you know, unstable equilibrium branch and therefore you can have a transition to this stage, okay? So I, I personally prefer to call them stochastic transitions. Also, is that what people call uh, noise induced tipping? No, something different, okay. So stochastic transitions basically, where you're not near a tipping point, where you're not near a bifurcation point, but noise drives you across the unstable branch. So one can call those stochastic transitions. Of course, you know, it's also the noise that drives you, even if you're here, it is really the noise that eventually drives you across, except that you are so close to the bifurcation point that I, there the, the, the stochasticity itself is, you know, uh, a mere incidental, uh, uh, you know, uh, feature that drives, but here it's an essential, large stochastic is essential for this transition to happen. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, you can call it, so that's debatable, you know. Uh, so it has an abrupt transition. It has, you're right, you're right. So it has an abrupt change, but it has happened for a, also a large change in the system, right? So stochasticity has pushed it quite a bit. So in that sense, it is a you know large stochastic change in the driver that has made this switch. So it, I certainly think this should not be called the critical transitions that people use because it's either near the critical point. Um, uh, so I mean, yeah, it's debatable. You know, uh, you also you can decide what you want to call, <laughs> but I wouldn't call. I would call this as a tipping point, but not this. I mean, it's useful to have slightly differing terminologies also, otherwise everything is the same. And, okay, now uh, let me ask a question. Huh? Uh, so Partha covered about the idea of critical slowing down, right? So as you close, slowly come uh, to this tipping point and this bifurcation point and fall, what happens? The, the recovery rate of systems goes down, right? So therefore you see that system slows down in response to perturbations. And that is something that one can use as early warning signal. Would that be true here? If the transition is driven by stochasticity far away from the bifurcation point. Yeah. So this is one way you can have an abrupt transition. So you can use the word abrupt transition to mean both this and this, okay? But I would reserve the word tipping point to this, this. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just addressed that point that you mentioned. So, you know, it is a qualitative call one can take if the effect of uh, the bifurcation point is visible in measurable sense, right? You know, I would still call that. You're right that, you know, in both of both here and here, the stochasticity, stochasticity is the one that is eventually pushing you across. I fully agree with you on that. Except that here, the effect of the, uh, the slowing down is visible, but not here. Therefore, I would you know, call this a stochastic transition, but not this. So it, it doesn't mean that the transition that happened is here do not have stochasticity. Of course, everything has stochasticity. Mm -hmm. Hi, as I said, I think you know, the moment you observe critical slowing down, Together with an abrupt massive change, I would call that, you know, uh, a tipping point or a critical. 
you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, so you can never really address this question. I know how some of these qualitative features, of course, you will never be able to fully address. For example, uh, even in physics, you know, for the idea of critical slowing down, I don't know how many of you know, it actually came from physics in 1970s again. And um, now uh, people discovered uh, via various simulations that, uh, and also experimental dynamics that, you know, you observe these uh, very slow dynamics near phase transitions. Uh, now you can ask a physicist, of course, ask the same question. How close do I need to be to the critical point of phase transition to observe effects of slowing down? And, it, and there is no universal answer to this. It entirely depends on the specific material of which you are studying the phase transition. Now, some materials, that region, what's called critical region is pretty wide. You know? Whereas for some other materials that could be really narrow and there is no easy way to a priori say what's what. So these qualitative features are hard enough even in physics where you have extremely controlled uh, uh, and well-behaved systems. So, you mean this one? Yes. Huh. That's the maximum limit. Right, and it's not the region, it's a maximum, so you will not. So now, now that we sort of touched upon the physics definition, I want to clarify one very important point. Okay. Uh, what is a phase transition and what is a, what, what is a tipping point? Okay. Uh, in physics, uh, phase transition, you know, is defined in sort of, you know, a couple of different ways. You know, let's now again think of the, uh, you know, the state variable that uh, what we call a state variable here would be uh, sort of replaced by what phase would call an order parameter. Okay. For example, if you're looking at a magnetic material, uh, you're looking at the magnetization. Okay. And then the driver in many of the systems is often temperature. Okay. And if you now plot the order parameter magnetization, for example, as a function of temperature, you find that for low temperatures, we have very high magnetism. And then it shows this behavior. Okay. So this point where you know there is a sharp corner, you know, in the behavior of the system of the order parameter is called the critical. And uh, the fact that this sharp trans, although this is a nonlinear sharp transition, it is still continuous. No, so this is also therefore a continuous phase transition. Okay. And it is really at this point that you observe the features of critical slowing down you know, near in this region. On the other hand, you can also have discontinuous phase transitions where the order parameter does this has a discontinuous term. The order parameter itself has a discontinuous term. Here, the slope of the order parameter has a discontinuous term. Okay. Now, what is interesting is that for this system, uh, physicists will claim that there is no critical slowing down. So in the physics literature, the discontinuous transitions do not have a, any warning signals. They do not have any signature. Okay. Now to understand this is a bit difficult, but an easy way to understand is using the idea of potentials. Okay. So what happens is in this region, uh, a potential would look like this. A low order parameter has a deep potential. Okay. It has a high order parameter has a shallower potential. So now a physical system has like 10 power 3, 20 power 23 particles that are interacting. And, uh, and those really large systems are fabulous in finding the global minima. Okay. Uh, okay. And, uh, and, 
And when we plot this, we always, the intention is to plot the equilibrium values. Now, meaning if you have waited long enough and if you have large enough system. And in those limits, finding this global minima is often very, very fast. Okay. On the other hand, in, if you are in this state, the potential will look like this. So then this becomes the, low, oh, I think I just have plotted the, in terms of the numbers, you know, please, please don't please discard that, okay. Uh, so this is now the global, uh, you know, minima. And then the, this uh, point where the switch between the two happen, at that point, you will have a symmetric bistable potential. Okay. The moment the symmetry is broken, one way or the other, that becomes the equilibrium phase, okay? Uh, and system is really good in finding that global minimum, okay? So therefore, from when you go from here to here, um, uh, you know, you will have this as the global minimum, and therefore that's the free equilibrium phase, likewise in this case here, okay? Uh, so, and as you can see that, you know, the entire idea of critical slowing down is based on the fact that as I go from here to here, uh, I'm actually more likely to be in this unstable equilibrium where there is a very flat potential. And when objects roll in flat potential, you will experience slowing down. That picture doesn't even arise here, which is the reason why physicists will say a discontinuous phase transitions do not have a critical slowing down. But despite that, so what is the difference between these two then? You know, underlying mathematics is very, very similar. I think really fundamentally different. Of course, underlying physics is very different, okay? Uh, so what is really different is the fact that in complex system literature, you know, we are again looking at this similar potential picture, except that we assume the system is not able to find this global minima very rapidly. It takes time to find that global minima. Therefore, you actually experience a shallow well of this, what physicists would call a, you know, not a global uh, equilibrium, metastable state. Uh, you actually do experience that fully. And it is really uh, the entire idea of critical slowing down working in, uh, uh, working in uh, complex systems is contingent on the fact that we can explore this shallow potential before I switch over to the deeper potential. And if that doesn't happen for any reason, then you will not have any early warning signs. Okay. And if it, if, and on the other hand, if you find shallow potentials in the absence of critical slow, in the absence of any transitions, you will again experience slowing down. So, which means that critical slowing down as a metric could both have failed alarms. It can fail to provide alarms under some conditions. It can also provide false alarms. Uh, even though there is a continuous phase, you know, continuous transition, you will actually end up finding that, or you will actually end up finding critical slowing down, but you may also wrongly interpret that as a sign of an upcoming abrupt transition, which need not be the case at all. So one has to really have a good understanding of the system you are studying, you know, whatever the processes that are underlying, sort of make some reasonable uh, interpretations of whatever analysis we do. I have taken too much time for my review. Okay, so I'll stop here. I'll then move to uh, facial systems now. Okay, I think I can continue. Okay, now, now all of this picture, uh, especially this mathematical picture, right, of this type, assume something implicitly, which is that, you know, I, I have this, you know, uh, ecosystem or some complex system, and I measure one quantity out of this system, okay? And I measure this quantity over time, and then I will observe its features. Now here is the sort of you know obvious uh, you know uh, problem with this. So if you think of any biological system, although I can measure one quantity out of it, for example, population size, but you know the population size is measured over some spatial scale, right? Uh, the question is that. Uh, you know, over this entire spatial scale, do I measure one average quantity over the entire space? Is that what this actually means? 
when we say the population size as an equation for a population size. Okay, so if you, for example, if this is the population size, this is the effect of competition on it, if the effect of uh, harvesting on it. Uh, how did we arrive at the arrive at this equation given that the actual system is spread over space? If you are looking of fisheries, for example, the organisms are spread in space, harvesting happening at local scales, and uh, reproduction and death are happening on local scales, but I have nevertheless written down a very simple equation as if the entire ecosystem is a point. Okay, without worrying about how things are spread in space. Okay. And uh, is there something useful about the way how things are spread in space? You know, if I'm doing an average, for example, look at this room. We have uh, 25 people in this room. The density of this room is 25 divided by whatever the area, right? But you see there is, there is there are interesting clustering patterns. There is nobody there, right? So could something like that be happening in, uh, happening in, uh, uh, in these systems? And could those features tell us something about the stability of ecosystem. So that motivates us to actually look at not just what these kind of equations where the spatial spread of organisms is fully ignored, that motivates us to consider, you know, how does the spatial spread of organism uh, look like for these systems that can show tipping points? And can those spatial spread tell us something about uh, the stability of ecosystems or early warning signals of tipping points, okay? That's a broad motivation why we would like to study a spatial model, not just, uh, you know, I mean, these are called mean field models. We would also like to study spatial models. Now, of course, there will be some very genuine circumstances when this is really a better description and the spatial description is not really required. If you're, let's say, growing some microbes in a small petri dish and you're constantly stirring it, you know, then this is a really good, uh, you know, metric because things are, getting mixed up, wherever things get mixed up a lot, these kind of uh, descriptions are pretty, pretty decent. However, when things don't get mixed up on fast enough time scales, it's important to study how things are spread in space. Okay. So with that motivation, uh, we will do the following things. We will, uh, uh, so that we have following goals for today. write some spatial models, okay? And then I will introduce, in doing so, I will introduce two frameworks to do so. One is called a reaction diffusion framework. And the other one is called a uh, cellular automata models. Okay, so I'll introduce two frameworks. And the distinguishing feature of them is that here life is continuous, here it's discrete. I mean, <laughs> when I say life, I mean, the space is, con space is uh, uh, continuous and the space is dis discrete. But in both the cases, we can sort of think of time as continuous, although the specific example I will introduce here will have a discrete time as well. Okay. And then the second goal will be, again, you know, uh, how will the tipping point manifest uh, in our measurements? You know, what's the effect of proximity to tipping points in uh, how dynamics place. Now, as you remember, in the context of simple time series, you know, this kind of models, where if you added noise, if we added noise, for example, I'm going to use the board really horribly. We had these features, right? Like, you know, basically there was increasing uh, amount of fluctuations. And then, uh, you know, one could also measure slowing down in some using some metrics using correlations, for example, and we had this feature, we could make these predictions about how time series dynamics changes before a tipping point in, in time. We can ask similar question here. Now, at every point in time, we do we have just one population size measurement? 
No, we have the measurement across the entire space. How will that entire spatial measurement look like as we approach tipping points? So that's the question we'll ask. Spatial dynamics. So I'm using tipping points synonymously to the bifurcation points here. So these are two broad goals. Okay, so let's start with uh, writing a very simple model. This is still okay. I have, have I reached the end of uh, where I should be writing? I think it's been erased now. I think if I keep yeah, maybe I can go some more, right? Yeah, up to this point. Okay. Um, so let's start. How much time do we have before we take a small break? Another five minutes. Let's write the equation and then, and then move, move forward. Now, how do you even add spatial dynamics? You need to have some uh, sort of you know intuition about the processes in space that is happening. And uh, what would that be? Any guesses? So, you know, again, maybe it's useful to have an example in mind. So, for example, uh, let's take uh, the harvesting model that uh, Parts introduced. Um, if that is the model, uh, what does X represent? It X represents the population size, right? Okay. That means population means a bunch of individuals, right? Uh, now, how do you incorporate space? What is the spatial dynamic that we have forgotten when we wrote that? Migration, right? You know, basically, what do you mean by migration? It's actually individuals move, right? In a individuals in a population move, and uh, how do they move? Huh? How do they move? They walk, okay. <laughs> they run, <laughs> they swim, okay. So if you don't know how they move, what do you do? You assume they do randomly. So anything you don't know in mathematics, you know, in, when we are modeling, you assume it's random. Okay, so, so one assumption we can make is that, you know, I'm looking at population in space, where there are a population, of course, consists of individuals, large number of individuals. Uh, and uh, it's good to have a space, some sort of a picture. Uh, so instead of measuring a population size in this entire landscape, uh, we can think of, you know, there is some sort of a discretized space world. I mean, you know, discretization is for my convenience. The space is still continuous, okay? So what we can do is there is some population here, there is some population here, there's some population here, 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 everywhere. There is some population density to every one of these, you know, imaginary grids I have just written down. And if I assume, of course, you know, each grid has some individuals. And as somebody said, they migrate, which means they move. And then if I don't know how they move, I can assume it's random. And if I assume it's random, you know, Shudeep will come to my rescue and say that a random motion of individuals basically translates to what? Diffusion at the concentration level, right? You know, uh, you know that's precisely sort of, you know, one of the fundamental contributions of Einstein. So we are relying on Einstein to write this. So basically if uh, particles move randomly, but if you look at the concentration profile, it looks like they are basically a diffusion equation is a good approximation. Okay, so now let us change our notations a bit. So X is a horrible notation for a spatial model population. Let us change our notations. Let's call, what shall we call for population size? Maybe we can call B uh, to indicate that there is some biomass. Okay, pop biomass is, you know, basically, num you know, if you lump all the individuals, if you weigh them in a weighing pan, whatever the number you get, okay. So there's some biomass, except that this B depends on the location and of course time. So all these locations, uh, there is some value of B and then that changes. It, it need not be same all, all throughout. Okay, and then, uh, so we write that as B X of T. And, uh, and, and the individuals that constitute B are moving randomly, okay? So if the, let us assume that locally, 
let's say on a small so small enough scale the rate of change of so locally we can assume that you know this equation is still true you know the formalism we have been using so far you know i can define a population density and then i can write down an equation of db by dt is equal to f of b locally okay let's assume that is the case and let us assume that these individuals are moving random see if that is the case that for the entire spatial setup we can write down now an equation of this type instead of b dot which is db by dt i now have a partial derivative to account for the fact that i am only looking at at a location x how is it changing over time how is the population density changing over any given local location and then we assume that in that location this is still true so i'm not going i won't be repeatedly writing the the arguments for b i will just drop that over time but in this first case i will okay so this is still true but you know is this the only thing that happens you know if this was a closed landscape with disconnected from the rest this would be true but you know there are random movement of individuals therefore we sort of express that as diffusion okay so this is a general form in which you can write down generalize the dynamical system model for a population to a spatial context okay so the local dynamics is given by the same growth rate function and in addition you have a diffusion okay and um, um, and this is called the reaction diffusion equation take a small break now